Well, good morning. What a great song, amen? Well, all the music's great, but that's my favorite song, so thank you, Jeff. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10, as we finish this three-part series on the testimony of the redeemed. And uh, let me give you a couple praise reports. Uh, There are times that people are listening to these that don't live around here, don't go to this church, and I only know that to be true if they send me an email or or whatever. Um, I have had several people who are not in Mount Vernon, who do not go to this church, uh, in the last couple of weeks, send me their uh, uh, testimonies for me to look at. And the praising part is that God could use what we're doing here in other people's lives. Amen? Um, and so I praise the Lord for that. Um, in fact, I just got a call from a friend down in North Carolina, um, Delbert, Delbert, I know you're going to listen to this. Um, he had said something to me this week, I think this week, about how he had felt really impressed on the Lord that he should really put all of his efforts into trying to lead someone to Christ this year. And, uh, well, that got me excited. And, uh, and I shared with him that we, since January 1, have, have, tr- have been trying to understand, equip ourselves uh, with what is needed so that we can be the best ambassadors we can be for the glory of the Lord and for the salvation of the lost. And so he listened to these sermons all week and he called me this morning, fired up. And, and, uh, um, and he also brought up a, a friend of his who's a pastor about how, um, Delbert, I hope I get this right, that he, he's concerned about because he thinks he's sending mixed messages about salvation, about God, Jesus. And a lot of times, and and the guy might be right, he just might be, I don't know how you could, but maybe there's a good reason. Um, um, And I've told you about, I I use a phrase all the time, religious lost or lost Christian. And I know that's an oxymoron, and I say it that way on purpose. I, you know, because there are people that sit in churches every week in America, possibly this one, who think they're saved and they're not. And um, sometimes the most dangerous thing you can do or be is someone that's been in the church a long time where you can regurgitate biblical facts about something without ever having been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So you've got the people in church that they think they're saved because they've always been in church. Well, I, pastor, I've, I've been a Christian all my life. Can that be true, guys? I'm asking, I'm not asking it rhetorically. Can that statement be true? Well, now you're breaking my heart. (laughs) I have people say to me, Pastor, I've been a Christian all my life. Can that be true? Can you be a Christian all your life? I mean, you're not a Christian when you're a baby. You're not a Christian, you know, probably when you're four, five, six, seven. One of the missing ingredients that lost Christians have or don't have is that they've never experienced by the Holy Spirit the understanding of the weight of their sin. That's why child professions are so dangerous. Because children, you know, they can be scared to come up for, you know, oh my gosh, hell, I better, you know, you know, uh, or well-meaning moms and dads uh, want them to be saved, and so they force-feed them the biblical truths that can get them saved, and then 
Johnny or Sally want to be, they want to please mom and dad. And so they, they, uh, you know, and then they, you know, come up the aisle and you ask them, Johnny, why are you here? And Johnny looks at you like, I don't have a clue why I'm here, but mom sort of told me this Sunday I was going to go up. And mama has rehearsed with Johnny all week what he was supposed to say. But when Johnny gets up here, Johnny's freaking out and he can't remember the rehearsed script. Even though mama or daddy's saying, hey, Johnny, tell him, tell him, Johnny, tell him, tell him, Johnny, tell him. And that's well-intentioned. Mom and dad want Johnny saved. I wanted my kids saved. But I believe true conversion can only really be had when the person has an understanding of their rebellion before God. You know, the word repent, right? Repent, repent. Well, repent means in the Greek, a turning of the mind, which, it, which when it's biblical repentance, when the mind turns the feet and the mouth, everything turns with it. Well, until Johnny can biblically repent, because Johnny understands by the Holy Spirit that he has the weight of his own rebellion before God, that's when Johnny is ready to be saved. Can it happen at eight? Yes. 20? Yes. 50? Yes. 70? Yes. But I don't know how Johnny can claim Jesus when you got to go to the foot of the cross. And what happened on the cross is that Jesus took the sins of the world, my sins, your sins, and the father heaped them all upon his son, Jesus. And Johnny or Sally need to understand the weight of their sin. So that's why inherent in the good news is the bad news. I mean, Jesus is only spectacular when you realize what he's done for you. Right? That's why Paul in Ephesians 2 doesn't start with verse 4, but God. The first thing Paul does is he starts in verse 1, and the first three verses Paul deals with who we were before we were saved. And verses 1 through 3 encapsulate all of humanity that's ever been alive. Our lives before Christ are in those three verses. Remember what I've told you. Each of our salvation stories are unique. I mean, mine's different than Sally. Sally's different than Tammy. Tammy's different than Trudy. We all have a unique story. Oh, some of them might have some of the same things. A preacher was preaching. I felt led of the Lord to come forward and give my life to Jesus. And sometimes it's, it could be on a boat. It could be in the woods. It could be at work, at a, at a lunch break, someone sharing the gospel. All of us have these unique individual stories about how we gave our life to Jesus. What was going on? And that's okay. Okay. They're, they don't have to be cookie cutter. But the theology of our story cannot be up for debate. And I don't think you'll share your testimony will, well, excuse me, unless you follow what Paul has laid out in these first 10 verses in Ephesians chapter 2, which I've coined the testimony of the redeemed, because the theology of everyone's salvation is found in these 10 verses. Verses 1 through 3, who we were before our encounter. Now, when I say that, I got to thinking this week about that. Contained in the who we were should be that one day you came to understand that you were a sinner, that the wrath of God abided on you, and that you were rebellious before God, because all of us are outside of Jesus. And so in your personal testimony, you need to be able to share that reality with them in whatever words and phrases that God gives you at the moment. 
who we were, dead in our trespasses and sins. We followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience according to the course of this world and the children of disobedience. And we were by nature children of wrath. And see, when you get to that phrase in your witness, as you show them this, they need to understand wrath from what? That's when you get to tell them. You see, I'm redeemed from the wrath of God. What do you mean by that? Well, there is a God who created us, put us in the garden in a perfect setting, and the first parents on earth blew it. And you might take them back to Genesis 2 and 3 and show them that. And then once that happened, the seed of man was corrupted so that every single child that has ever been born since Adam and Eve were created by God is born with a sin nature, if you will, is born with that nature that is under the wrath of God. Everyone, whatever your age. You need to get comfortable sharing that because see, the whole purpose of you sharing your testimony is that you're not gonna tell them all of that three verses apply to them before you tell them it applies to you. And even though you're a Christian right now and they're not, the only reason you are is because those first two words in verse four, but God. Amen. Amen? Have we made that clear? Salvation is all of God. So one through three, who we were, who were you? Who were you before Christ? You need to get comfortable telling that story. You say, well, I don't really think I ever did much sin. Well, that's your issue. You don't realize what sin is and how corrupt your nature is. We've all sinned to come short of the glory of God, Paul says. We've all been rebellious before God. And then verses four through nine, but God, what the triune God has done to save us. I say to the triune God, God the Father, of the triune God set the plan before the foundation of the world. God the Son came and executed the plan, came to this earth, born of uh, earthly parents. The seed uh, uh, was implanted in Mary's womb outside of Joseph. Uh, uh, and, and, and then he lived a sinless life. He died a sacrificial death. And on the third day, he, he array, arose from the dead. And, that, and then the Holy Spirit, what's his job? The Holy Spirit's job now, since Jesus has gone back to heaven, is he is the one that lifts the veil from your heart and shows you the glory of the Son. You see, there are some denominations that seem to make more of the Holy Spirit than they do Jesus. But Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to reveal me, Jesus. Jesus is at the apex of the story. It's not the Holy Spirit, though he's one third the Godhead. It's not God the Father. And that's why Jesus said in John 10, he said, I am the door. In John 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. In John 10, he says, I'm the door. And if any man tries to get up any other way, he's a thief and a robber. Now, how do people try to get up any other way? Works, right? Works. Uh, because my grandpappy was the preacher. Uh, baptism. I read my Bible. Uh, I hold an office in the church. Uh, all of those, if you're hanging on to those to get you saved, you're a thief and a robber, according to Jesus. All of that. None of that can save you. None of it. Well, I'm better than most Christians I know. That might be true, but all of y'all are lost. You see, Christians aren't perfect. We're redeemed. And I know part of the problem with we Christians is we're so arrogant and so self-righteous in our faith. We get saved and then we want to thumb our nose at those that are broken with, and, and they're dirty and they don't smell so good. And they, you know, and, and, and God must be broken over ambassadors that operate that way. So today, one verse, 
1 through 3, who we were, verses 4 through 9, what God did, uh, what the triune God did, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, we are the workmanship of God. That's the title of my sermon. It's not original. Paul wrote it. We are the workmanship of God. What we're going to answer today is what is God's expectation for those that he has saved by grace and that, that time between your salvation and heaven. What is God's expectation of us? Well, we're going to see it in verse 10. I want to read 8, 9, and 10 just for some context. Paul writes, For by grace you, me, us, have been saved through faith. Faith means to trust. And that not of yourselves, that's so important, we cannot save ourselves. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And when you're witnessing, one of the things I love to do, Sally, is, you know, I say like, like, what if I went out and bought you this Bible today and I put it in a box and I wrapped it and I put your name on it uh, to Sally from Jim. Uh, when is this gift yours? Is it yours simply because I put your name on it? No, when is this gift yours, Sally? When I give it and you take it. God's hand is outreached for you today, my friend. His gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And his gift with an outstretched arm or for those that he's calling and saving. But we have to take the gift. Right? And so Paul says, verse 9, it's, our salvation is not as a result of works. So that why? Why, Paul? Why does God not allow us to have any part in our own salvation? And you can answer this with the last half of verse 9. So that no one may boast. So that no one may boast. God won't share his glory with anyone. He won't share it with you. You're not going to share it with me. But God. It didn't say but Jim. Amen. It didn't say but Sally. It didn't say but Trudy. It didn't say but Mary. It said but God. Right? Rich in mercy. Through the great love he had for us. Made a way out of our sin. Through the sending of his son Jesus Christ. So what does verse 10 say? Because this is the after. For we are his workmanship. Now the his there is God's. The father. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. So God, when he gave you salvation, he gave you a new birth. Remember, that's what Jesus said in John 3, right? Told Nicodemus, except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So when God saves you, this, this, this amazing thing takes place. Titus 3, we're told that the Holy, we're regenerated on the inside by the Holy Spirit, okay? So the Holy Spirit does this mysterious work on the inside of us. He, he implants in us this new nature, right? We have the old nature, salvation. But now we have this new nature in Christ. And that's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, he said, if anyone is in Christ, you see, that's what salvation is in Christ. If you're in Christ, you have become a new creation. Okay, that new creation starts on the inside when the Holy Spirit, according to Titus 3, regenerates us. And I, you say, well, pastor, what, 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 what on earth is that? Well, I, I can't, I, I know it happened to me, uh, but I, I, can't, I can't really explain too much about how he regenerated me. I just know that one day I was lost and now I'm found. I know that before I prayed that prayer, I was blind, but then I could see. I know that before I was regenerated, I was in a hope hopeless, helpless condition. And when I was regenerated by the Holy Spirit through my faith in Christ, I, I instantaneously had a hope, a living hope placed in me. So God, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And why did God do that? Well, certainly for his glory. Isaiah 43, 7 makes, Isaiah 43, 7 makes clear all those that he created, he created for his glory. But while you and I remain on this earth, if you're born again, the next three words tell you what you should be about 
until either Jesus comes back or he takes you to heaven. You ready? This is, this is what should happen beginning with your regeneration. Four good works. Those three words should sum up the life of every believer who is regenerated by the Holy Spirit, who's placed their faith in Christ, has repented of their sins, placed their faith in Christ at the cross, that great exchange. I gave Jesus all my sin and he gave me his righteousness so that when I stand before God, I have a positional sanctification, a positional righteousness, which means God will never again look at Jim in any other way but through the blood of his son. How great is that truth when we fail so much? God never looks at Jim through any other lens, but through the blood of his son. And from that day in that apartment in Evansville, Indiana, to this day that I'm standing and for every day I stand, as long until Jesus comes back or I'm taken, and it's true for you too, for good works. That's why God has made you his workmanship. Yes, he wants a relationship with you. Yes, one day we're going to walk with God again like they did in the garden. We're going to get to do that again. Like God, the Father, God, the Son. I mean, like, like I'm going to see Jesus. I, I mean, I, I'm going to stand before. Well, maybe not. I might be on my face. But I'm going to be in the prayer. I'm going to be in the prayer. Well, really, right? I mean, if you read uh, Revelation 5, there's a whole lot of worship with a whole lot of faces in the, in the ground praising him. But until that day, God has created me, recreated me in Christ for good works. Now go home. That is what's next after verse nine, Sally. Four through nine is but God. It's what he did to save us. One through three is who we were before Christ. Verse 10, this single verse tells you what the Christian life is all about. Now you can add other things to it for Pete's sakes. We've got, you know, all the books in the New Testament, but I'm saying in that is these, these three words. We have been recreated in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we, who's the we there, those that are in Christ Jesus, okay, the we, not church people, not the religious lost, not lost Christians. If you're born again today, this is for you, right? That you were recreated in Christ Jesus for good works, which God the Father prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. It's interesting. It's interesting if it, the book ends of, of uh, Ephesians 2, when in verse, uh, hold on. Well, yeah, in verse uh, 2, well, 1 and 2, and, and you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. That's how we walked back in the day, right? To the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, Satan. Uh, that's how we walked. We walked with that, that we were in that flow. We were headed in that direction. And then verse four says, but God, and after the but God, and now that you're in Christ Jesus, guess what? You're walking a new path. <laughs> now you're walking in Christ. And by the way, repentance is the turning of the mind which if it's God that's done the repentance in your life, will, will turn your feet. Your mind doesn't go one way and your feet another. Your mind turns your feet, right? Man, oh man. So we have been, we are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus for good works. You know, the New Living Translation translates the, the workmanship. They translate it God's masterpiece. How beautiful is that? 
You know, when God made man, we were his highest creation. Did you know that? I can't even see y'all out there. Did y'all know that? That when God created Adam and Eve, they were the pinnacle of his creation, of all that he created. It wasn't the stars, it wasn't the beauty of the tree. Like, like, like we're watching some of these good, wholesome shows, and they're filmed in Canada. And, and, and the beauty, Alberta, Canada, like I told Trudy, like vacation to me would be, we'd get a cabin, we'd have a fire, and if it wasn't too cold, we'd sit in a lawn chair outside the cabin and just behold the majesty of God and the beauty. And then this morning, I think it was this morning, you looked up the temperature in Alberta, it was 21 below. Not the wind chill, the temperature was 21 below. But the good news is the high for the day was going to be 10 below. And then I realized God did not wire me to sit in a lawn chair at 21 below zero. So I'm headed south. So God has created us for good works. John MacArthur, quote number one, he said this about that walking in these good works. He said, before we can do any good work for the Lord, he, God, has to do his good work in us. You see, in, in other words, good works are what's born out of being in Christ, right? Like if you're lost here today and you try to run out of here today because uh, you're going to impress God and he's going to accept you because you're going to run around and start doing these good works, friends, you're not going to make it. That's what the Israelites were doing. They were trying to earn their own righteous way into heaven. But J John MacArthur's right. Before we can do any good work for the Lord, he has to do his good work in us. By God's grace, made effective through faith, we become his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. The same power that created us in Christ Jesus empowers us to do the good works for which he has redeemed us. And in other words, here, this is an important truth for you today. God will never ask you to do something that he doesn't give you the power to accomplish. God will never set you up for failure and then laugh at you. There's not a single thing God will ask out of your life that he doesn't give you the power to do. Now, remember this. In the Old Testament, some of those prophets preached and they were thrown in jail. God must have met. No, no, because God he was going to use what these guys said against the people they were preaching to. So don't assume victory or success by something good happening, because sometimes God is sending you out because you're going to give a witness so that on that day, that final day, God's going to say to them, I sent my servant, Sally, Pam, Trudy, Jim, uh, and you rejected them. But he will equip you for every good work. Praise God. The reformers used to say this, it is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies can never be alone. In other words, it's like this, good works have no part in your salvation. You understand that? Good works have no part of your salvation. But listen carefully, but if you're born again, you will have good works. You see, good works are the fruit of a redeemed life in Christ. You will have them. It's like the Holy Spirit, right? The fruit of the Spirit. We don't get some of them, but not all of them in Galatians 5. No, no, no. When, when you're redeemed, when you're regenerated, you have all of the fruit of the... Now, whether you operate in them or not is, is another story, but they're there. And that's why we have to die to self, guys, so that we can operate in the spiritual realm. Right? So that we can operate in the spiritual realm. Okay. So let's look at this. Good works. I want to establish that these good works are for all of us. So Titus 2, 11 through 15. Paul has, has sent a letter to Titus who was at Crete, C-R-E-T-E, -E, pastoring a people. And here's what Paul tells Titus. He says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. You know, that's another phrase, the grace of God has appeared. Do you know what that phrase is for? Who it's talking about? Jesus. 
He's the manifestation of the grace of God. Bringing salvation to all men. Now that all there isn't all of humanity. All of humanity is not going to be saved. But all that God is saving is the all there. Okay? Instructing us. Who's instructing us? The grace of God that has appeared, the Lord Jesus Christ. Bringing salvation to all men. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So when we're going to do these good works, guess what? We've got to put off the bad works, right? The things we used to do that were wrong, we've got to stop them. Stop them dead in their tracks. And now we're going to let the Spirit lead us, and we're going to do these good works for the Lord. Okay, so we're being instructed to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Friend, let me say this real quick. If there is no difference between you and the world, you are not living for Jesus. They ought to see a difference in you. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself, Jesus, for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. You see, the zealousness is something given you, by the way. When, when, we, when Christ lives within us and we're led by the Spirit, we're going to develop a zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Then we move into chapter 3. And like I said, when you read your Bible, understand Paul did not write a letter with chapters and verses. We did that when we translated the Bible. So he's going to continue with this thought to Titus. And he says in verse 1, Remind them, who's the them? Those that have been saved. Remind them to be subject to rulers. Are you listening? Well, surely he means good rulers, right? Ones that we agree with. Is that what he's saying? Remind them. To be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good need. Now, obedient to the point where what our, our laws would dictate that we go against the law of God, then we separate. Let's be clear on that. Here you go. Ready? Verse 2. This might make some people cancel their Facebook page. You ready? <laughs> to malign no one. To malign no one. Well, I don't like what they said. To malign no one. To be peaceable, Christian. We're to be peaceable. Gentle. Showing every consideration for all men. Now that all men there is not Christians. It's just all men. Christians and lost alike. By the way, he's talking about good works here. Okay. All right. This isn't all inclusive, but it is like part of that word to walk in. And then he's going to say in verse three, Paul says, for we also once were foolish ourselves. See, that's why we can't get self-righteous about any of this. That's why we shouldn't get indignant at, at their lost wickedness as if we weren't once lost and wicked, Pat. And by the way, the day I don't die to Jim, guess what happens? Old Jim pops out and he's all full of wickedness. Can you handle a preacher telling you that? Any preacher that won't tell you that's a liar. I got to crucify my flesh every day just like you do. And we all know the day that we have it. Amen. Nobody has to tell you that. You know. Remind them. To be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. 
For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lust and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. And by the way, that's just another way of him saying uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, right? That's just Paul again, emphasizing who we were. Man, when you read that, we were pretty ugly, weren't we? I ain't talking about your looks. That could be true, but I'm not talking about them. Okay. I'm sure, Pat, that would fit in here somewhere. I just want to see if y'all picked up on it. For we also were once foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. You see, there's too much of that going on in the church, man. We don't call it hate. We just say we don't like them. How can you not like your brother? You know what John says in 1 John? He says, how can you say you love God and hate your brother? He said, you're a liar. You're, you're a liar. I hope you're listening. But that's who we were. Verse 3. Now look, verse 4, the transition. You ready? But when the kindness of God, our Savior, hallelujah, and his love for mankind appeared. Now, who was his love for mankind that appeared? I'm sorry? Christ. Who said that real loud? Bold. Yeah, Pam. Say it. Say it. When Christ appeared. Well, God, what happened when Christ appeared? He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness. Your deeds that you do after you're saved are not part of your salvation package. They're not. But according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, what I told you happens on the inside of you. And that's one of the ways you can know you're born again. Are you changed? I mean, like, really, are you changed? Like when I got saved, I got changed. Now, now that old gym was there and I got to beat, you know that game where those, those things pop up and you got to bang them on the head? That's what I feel like I do with the old me. You know that game I'm talking about? Boom, 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 boom. The old gym and all of his lust, I got to keep pounding them down, man. Boom, boom. How's that for a visual? Let me read verse five. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. That's what verse four of Ephesians two says, that he's rich in mercy. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, that's what the Holy Spirit does to you on the inside, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So you see right there, you have the whole Godhead involved in your salvation. Now Jesus is the one you surrender to. But you do that because the Holy Spirit has led you to that. You see what I'm saying? God, the Father's in heaven, orchestrating it all, sending his spirit out. And, and so that he would save those that he's saving. It's just a beautiful, when you really can settle that in your mind and heart, this beautiful picture of the Godhead at work. And so verse 7 this is what's going to be the result of your salvation. So that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We're joint heirs with Christ. How cool is that, right? This is a trustworthy statement that he's just said. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. Oh, church, that we could speak as Pam did and speak confidently. If you go out and try and be a witness for you, and you like, well, I think, and I, I hope, and I mean. well, you wouldn't buy something off a salesman that acted that way. Well, I think it's a pretty good car. I, you know, I'm, it's, you know, we haven't had too much trouble. I mean, it's nobody under God in God's creation has something to sell like we do. <laughs> And I hate to use that phrase, but you know what I'm saying by it, right? 
Nobody. That's why Paul says to Titus. This is why he said, listen to me. This is a trustworthy statement, what he's just said. And concerning these things that I just spoke about, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God about his son, not a belief in God that saves you because you believed in God, but what you believe in what God has said you need to do to be saved, which is give your life to Jesus Christ. So that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. And not just save men. Our good deeds, our good works are profitable for the lost. What do you mean, preacher? Here it is, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Here's what Jesus says could be the results of your good works out there. Remember, we're talking, oh, we need to do good deeds here, but out there. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. I swear to you, listen to me. I shouldn't swear like that. Listen to me. There are so many people that sit in churches every week. This is a bushel here, y'all. Like, there's plenty of light in here. Amen? Whether you show up or not, there's plenty of light. Out there in a dark world is where God wants you to take your light. And Jesus said, who put a... Who, 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 who puts a light on in the house and then puts a bushel over it? Because remember, the only way they had to light a house back in that day was candles. So who would light a candle, Pat, and then put something over it where the light wouldn't shine in the dark room? Jesus is asking a question. Like, I mean, he's making a statement, and it's, it's sort of rhetorical. It's nonsensical. But they, put, they light a lamp, put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Listen to me say, well, pastor, I don't know what my mission field is where I do the ministry of reconciliation and I use the word, it's your job and the people you work around, you're around them 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, that becomes your mission field. I'm not saying don't do your job and just stand around with the Bible, but you need to begin to pray, oh God, open up doors within my job, open up doors within the people I work around that I might get to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Open up doors to me. I'm spending 50, 60 hours a week in this place. So the place I've got that I can share Jesus becomes the people I'm at work with. I'm going to go to lunch with someone who I would never go to lunch with. But you see, I need to show him what living for Jesus is all about. And so I'm going to ask that dude to go to lunch with me that otherwise we wouldn't have anything in common. Because I'm going to let my light shine. Verse 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. In other words, our good works are visible to them, right? They're visible. And as a result of seeing them, check it out. They will glorify your Father who is in heaven which is the very purpose of our existence, Isaiah 43, 7. All those that God created, he created for his glory. How do we give glory to God every day? Well, we can say it with our mouth, but if our feet don't match our mouth, we're just a hypocrite. You understand what I'm saying? It's not you're, here, you're at, ch at church and you do all the pious stuff, and then on Monday you're the one telling the sick, twisted jokes, and, and you're eyeballing and oogling girls and... and uh, uh, you know, no, 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 Christian, we don't do that no more. We're, we're going to die to all that stuff we used to do. And we're going to start doing the deeds that God has for us that he prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. MacArthur states about the good works in verse 10. When God's people do good deeds, they bear fruit for his kingdom and for his glory. I want to read you something. I don't know who's back there today. I don't know if you guys, did you put all this together, this theological quote? I like boldness. All right, Lee, was that you back there? Now listen to this. Just listen to this. This is what 
I found a biblical definition of good works. I was looking around for it saying, okay, like, okay, what are good works? Like, how do we define this? What are we? And I thought this did a pretty good job. So here it is. You ready? The biblical definition of good works is not merely good deeds. The biblical definition of good works encompasses far more. Biblical good works encompass every aspect of our thinking and conduct before God. Good works encompass not only caring for the poor, but behaving in a godly way towards your employer. Good works encompass not only giving to the work and ministry of the church, but truly loving those within it. Good works encompass not only just distributing Bibles to those that have none, but seeking to understand, believe, and live everything that is between the covers yourself. There is a signature conduct that the world should see in every true Christian. The world that seeks to criticize us should have its mouth stopped because it sees the kind of new life that's in us. You know, they can tell lies about us, but they won't be true when we're walking in the power of the Spirit for the Lord Jesus Christ. See, let me bring this sermon to a close with these closing thoughts. You ready? The good works called for in Scripture encompass the whole of the Christian. All that we do by God's grace for God's purposes and for His glory. That should be the measure of the life you live now. All that we do, all that we do, by God's grace, for God's purposes, and for His glory. Colossians 3.17, Paul said it this way. You ready? He said, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. You know, what I'm not going to do for you today is give you a long list of good works because what we would do, what we have a tendency to do is we take that list home and we try and make sure we covered all those. Here's where you're going to find what those good works are right here. And you ought to spend the lifetime in it. There's no shortcut, guys. There's no cleft notes for the Bible. You can listen to podcasts and, and you can listen to preaching, but at some point, guys, if you really are going to become who God wants you to be, who he's recreated you to be, you have to become a student of this word. There are no shortcuts. That means we might have to give up some television. That means we might not get to do all of the hobbies we want all of the time because we're going to make time to become a student of God's word. And I know for some of us, when you hear that, first off, you're like, get off my back, preacher. But when we hear that, what we do sometimes, we're like, man, you know, listen, I work a lot of hours, pastor. So if I want to play some video games, I'm entitled. Well, I'm not going to argue whether you're entitled or not. I will say if those video games keep you from being in this word, you're really messed up in your thinking. You see, what I'm telling you is I'm not telling you to give up video games. I'm telling you to make sure that your top priority is to grow in grace and truth so that you can be the ambassador that God has called you to be. And I can't give you all that you need in one sermon, neither can anyone else on those podcasts until you can rightly handle this book and you can navigate its pages for the glory of God and for the sake of the lost. This has to become a priority. I promise you that's what God is saying to you today. If you're born again. If you don't really open the word of God Sunday to Sunday. And even now you're daydreaming this service away. I love you enough to say to you. I'm, I, I would be very concerned for you. If there is no attraction 
to Christ, to the Father, to the Spirit, to the good works that He's called us to. If you're not attracted to that, if you can leave here today unchanged and unmotivated, I worry for you. I'm not God. I will never judge your heart. It's not my place to do that. But you see, I am in this word. And I see it over and over and over again. I see what he calls us to and I see what we're not doing. And each of us have to make an individual decision. Sally, you can't make it for your son. Your son can't make it for you. I can't make it for Trudy. We can't make it for our kids. Each of us who claim Christ have been called, if we're saved, if we're in Christ, we've been called to the good works that God has before we are ever saved has set us up to do. And I'm not going to give you a list, but they're all in here. But I will tell you this, because in 2021, this is, this is going to be the heartbeat of this ministry, or certainly this pastor. And the heartbeat is going to be this. You know, each one reach one. Now, listen to me. I had someone call me this week, and if I didn't make this clear, I want to make it abundantly clear. Listen, God saves, we don't. What we should be is participating in the process. It might not be you, the one that gets to lead that final thing to Christ. I told you about Karen and Cherica. All, all I got to tell Cherica was that she was lost, and she left here wanting to punch me in my throat. Then she calls Karen, and Karen gets to lead her to Christ. Well, how fair is that? We're on the same team, guys. So I'm not saying that you personally have to be the final nail in their salvation. But you ought to participate in the process. And that's what I mean. You should participate in the process. Paul said, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. And we've been given a, a ministry of reconciliation. And a message of reconciliation. Like you don't have to whip the message up. It's right here in the Bible. That God would reconcile the world to himself through Christ. And that we, that God, would make his plea through us. The greatest witness God has, friends. And I tell you this all the time. The greatest witness God has. That he's real. Is a changed life. See, the people that used to know me would tell you something got a hold of me. Because it's not the gym they remember. Shouldn't that be true of all of us, though? All of the friends we had before Christ, shouldn't they be saying that about all of us? Like, okay, I don't know what happened. But I absolutely know something happened because we used to do such and such together. And now, that per she, she, he, uh -uh, they're not doing it. Well, they just think they're better. No, no, this person doesn't. See, I had a broke leg last year and they cut my grass every week. They brought food to us when my parent died. No, they, th this person doesn't think they're better than me. But they are changed. And just maybe, if you will live a life of good works, pursuing the lost with the ministry and message that God has placed you in. Just maybe God will lead someone to himself through your witness. And if it ever happens, I promise you this, it's going to change your life. It's going to engage you, excite you. Because I know for some of us, we think I'm not equipped. I don't know enough. You know, that's okay to make that statement where you're at. But if in another year you're saying it, that's an excuse. Because I'm giving you everything you need to know. Just what you're going to do with it.
Okay, so it's all right to admit, I don't know. It's not all right to stay there. But only you can make that choice for you. God will not force you. He wants us to want to, Sally. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, he said, And he died for all, so that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one that died for them. You see, for Paul, everything he did was because of what Jesus had done for him. Jesus had died for him. He laid his life down for him. And Paul was determined to lay his life back down for Jesus, not to be saved, but because he was. And that's what God wants out of you and I. Listen, maybe you're waiting for your spouse to get engaged. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but you will not be able to use that when you stand before God. Yeah, but every time I try to live for Jesus, it causes conflict. Jesus, Matthew 10, said it would. You're still commanded by your Lord to live a life of good works for the Father's glory and the salvation of the lost. So let's get busy. Let's be a team. And let's make it happen. Let's pray. Father, I love you so much. And I thank you for this group that has braved the weather to come out and be a part of this service. Bless their efforts, Father. Keep everyone safe on the way home, God. And wherever they might go this afternoon, dinner, or they got responsibilities out there, God, that we would just make sure that we drive sensibly and leave space and start to stop earlier. But Father, we have one purpose on this earth, and that's to live for you. The world will only care what we say when they can see what we do. That we show them a different way. Oh God, help us to do that. And we pray this in the name that is above all names, that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless. If you need me, 